Hello friends, my name is JJ. So the other day I bought this little collectible knickknack which purports to be part of a series of miniature replicas of eight of America's most beloved toys. You can see we got four different G.I. Joes, the Play-Doh Kid, Mr. Potato Head, the Operation Guy, Stretch Armstrong, Glow Worm, My Pet Monster, and the Monopoly Man. Which one did I get? Oh ho, it is the Monopoly Man. But anyway, I think we can agree that this is a pretty good canon of of eight of the most iconic American toys of modern times. But wait a second, I hear you say. If a single company is able to sell these, does this mean that a single company is also responsible for this entire American toy canon? Well, yes and no. For you see, today we will be talking about the history of these eight iconic American toys. And that history, in many ways, is also the story of the emerging dominance of one of America's greatest corporations, a corporation that slowly rose from humble beginnings to become a major juggernaut of American culture today. And which corporation is that? Well, you'll have to keep watching. So once upon a time, there were these brothers from Poland who emigrated to the United States and founded a toy company in 1923. Their names were Henry and Hillel Hassenfeld, the Hassenfeld brothers, the Hasbros. The Hasenfeld brothers lived in Rhode Island, and to this day, this is where Hasbro Industries is located. Rhode Island is a pretty small state without much going on, so having a major American toy company located there is a pretty big deal for them. If you are a Family Guy fan, this is why noted Rhode Islander Peter Griffin was depicted as working at a toy company in the early seasons. Anyway, the Hasenfeld family ran Hasbro directly for 80 years, from its modest beginnings in 1923 to 2003, by which point they were consistently pulling in over a billion dollars of profit a year. Their rise to this superstar status is particularly interesting, given that according to this excellent and really richly researched book on the history of American toys, Timeless Toys by Tim Walsh. A lot of the success that Hasbro enjoys today comes not from toys that they invented on their own, but rather the company's skill at buying up other people's toy ideas, or even entire toy companies, which are then incorporated into the Hasbro brand empire. So let's tell some of those stories. So Monopoly is, of course, the most popular board game in American history, and a big part of American culture more broadly, thanks to tropes like the annual McDonald's promotion and the endless churning out of new and increasingly goofy editions. It is also a game whose origins tend to get mixed up in a lot of legends and myths, so let's see if we can sort them out. Board games have been played in Europe since at least the 15th century, and you could make a strong case that they are one of our oldest toy traditions. But before the age of industrialization, and especially before the age of large toy corporations, Board games mostly fit into the realm of what we would call folk culture, which is to say things that people just sort of made on their own or were at best sold by small scale merchants, meaning there were no national brands or standards. And this is why the timeline of Monopoly's origins are kind of blurry and why it is difficult to say that one person invented it per se. In the early 20th century, there was this woman from Illinois called Lizzie J. McGee, came up with a board game based around real estate ownership. She was big into the theories of a guy called Henry George, who was a big economic commentator in those days. He was a man who was very critical of landowners who accumulated enormous amounts of wealth by charging rent for the use of their property and little else. And Mrs. McGee's landlord game, in which players bought property and charged each other increasingly exorbitant rents, was supposed to be a sort of clever Georgist commentary on the economy of modern America. But then, as now, Georgism was a kind of esoteric philosophy that a lot of people didn't really get. And in the folk culture ethos of the time, when people would make their own versions of Mrs. McGee's game, some of her more complicated rules that were intended to provide explicit political commentary got watered down in favor of just making the game simpler and easier. In 1933, a guy named Charles Darrow from that great cradle of American culture, Pennsylvania, made his own version of the landlord game, which he called Monopoly. And today we recognize him as the modern game's true founder, in the sense that he came up with all of the modern aesthetics, like the logo and the board design and the weird random game pieces and even good old 
Mr. Monopoly himself. In 1935, Charles Darrow sold his game to a Massachusetts-based toy company headed by George Charles and Edward Parker, the Parker Brothers, and they sold it for many years until the Parker Brothers Corporation was purchased by the Hasenfeld Brothers Corporation in 1991. People tend to want the story of Monopoly to be more political than it is, and there are a lot of retellings in which Darrow or the Parker Brothers stole Mrs. McGee's idea for a progressive board game and turned it into some grotesque celebration of American capitalism. But the reality was more bland. Darrow just made his own spin on a game that was already kind of floating out there in the broad cultural ether, and the Parker Brothers did compensate Mrs. McGee in the end as well. But what is undeniably true is that Lizzie McGee was a very political woman, and near the end of her life, she did grow quite bitter that the true message of the landlord game had been lost over time. Mr. Potato Head and Bucket of Farts. So, I've noticed that there is a temptation to want to believe that all of the great accomplishments of American culture were somehow accidental or inadvertent. I guess it just makes for more compelling stories when people achieve the next big thing through some random fluke. But in reality, a lot of the great American cultural achievements were pretty much just done by people who always set out to do what they did. So like Mr. Potato Head, for instance, a toy where you give a potato a funny face. That seems like a pretty random idea, but the origin story is simply that there was this guy from New York named George Lerner, and he thought making a funny face potato man might be something that kids would enjoy. So in 1949, he invented the Mr. Potato Head kit and sold it to the Hasbros in 1951. The one interesting twist to the story, however, is that in the first version of the toy, you were supposed to use a real potato as the base of the face. And this is culturally interesting for two reasons. One, it signals how ubiquitous potatoes had become in America by that point, a fact I discussed in my award-winning video on the history of potato chips. And two, it highlights how rich America America had become immediately following World War II, because only in an extremely wealthy society could you propose a wasteful idea like using food as a toy without it seeming utterly irresponsible. This is actually something that comes up a fair bit when you read about the history of Mr. Potato Head, how no toy company prior to the 1950s would have ever taken a chance on an idea this decadent. But decadence aside, it was of course ultimately deemed more practical and sanitary to just sell the Mr. Potato Head kits with a plastic potato included, and so that is what they have been doing from the 1960s on. Mr. Potato Head is also notable in that he is often described as being the first toy that was ever advertised on TV, a revolutionary but controversial practice that would forever change American toy culture, if not the culture of American childhood more broadly. I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious idea that someone was bound to come up with sooner or later, but I guess someone had to be the first. <laughs> Another toy that was one of the first of the TV era was this stuff, Play-Doh. Do you like Play-Doh? I have always uh, hated the smell of it, even though I know that for a lot of people, the smell is one of the main things they like about it. So I guess this one actually does have a kind of happy accident origin. In the old days, wallpaper was a lot more popular than it is now, and old wallpaper was literally made out of paper, so it would get wrecked if you tried to clean it with water. So people bought this stuff, wallpaper cleaner, which is basically just dough with soap in it that you could use to clean your walls, kind of like a giant version of one of those kneaded erasers, if you've ever seen those. But by the mid-1950s, a lot of people were turning away from wallpaper, or if they did have it, they were getting wallpaper made of easily cleaned vinyl, a practice which reflected the post-war takeover of plastics in all realms of American life. Plastic was originally a fairly obscure material, but during World War II, it started to be manufactured in huge amounts for the first time as a cheaper, and in some cases, better alternative to more organic materials like steel or rubber for building military equipment. And then after the war, all of this newfound plastic technology was basically used in every other aspect of American life too. But anyway, vinyl wallpaper helped kill off the wallpaper cleaning dough industry, but one enterprising young producer of the stuff, Joe McVicker of Cincinnati, Ohio, had an idea of how to keep his business afloat. What if we started selling wallpaper cleaning dough as a kind of clay that kids could play with? And thus, in 1955, this play dough was born. Joe sold his idea to the Kenner Toy Corporation of Ohio, who sold it under their name for many years before they were in turn bought by Hasbro Corp in 1991. G.I. Joe! 
So the story of G.I. Joe, the most successful toy Hasbro ever developed in-house, is a fascinating tale of America's fickle relationship with the military. In the early 1960s, Hasbro decided to see if they could sell dolls to boys, and in order to overcome the girly stigma that dolls had, they decided to give their boy doll the most macho job they could think of, Army guy. A lot of the Hasbro executives of the time were veterans of World War II or Korea, and thus had a certain reverence for the military that was common among men of their generation. And when the original G.I. Joe dolls were first released in 1964, that was still the dominant American cultural attitude overall, and the toys sold very well their first year. However, 1964 was also the year of the infamous Gulf of Tonkin incident that dramatically escalated America's involvement in the Vietnam War. By 1966, over 8,000 Americans had been killed in the conflict, which became incredibly unpopular in short order, and the image of the US military took a sharp hit as a result. Mothers didn't want their kids playing with toys that glorified the horrors of war, and the sales of G.I. Joe plummeted. Hasbro tried to save face by toning down the military angle, eventually even rebranding him as just Super Joe, but it was no use, and they retired the brand in the 1970s. But then in the early 1980s, the mood of the country started to change. As the trauma of Vietnam started to fade, the military became cool again. Old man Reagan was elected on his Kill the Bastards platform, and movies like Rambo or Box Office Smash, signaling a public eager for a return to a more traditional black and white morality. And so Hasbro brought G.I. Joe back, reborn as the real American hero, fighting the evil Cobra terrorists. And instead of dolls, the characters were now these cool action figures who also appeared in comics and books and video games. It was an incredibly ambitious multimedia extravaganza on Hasbro's part, and one that embodied what would become a new strategy of marketing toys to kids in the late 20th century. The toys themselves were no longer enough. You had to sell them a whole universe. This is often portrayed as a sort of crass and manipulative business strategy, and I suppose on some level it was, but it did also reflect the degree that children of the 1980s had just come to expect their toys to have a lot more lore. The rival Kenner Toy Corporation over in Cincinnati had obtained the license to make toys based on Star Wars in the late 1970s, and the huge popularity of these toys was often attributed to the fact that kids liked playing with things that had some connection to some larger fantasy world that could stimulate their imaginations. And from then on, if toys didn't come from some fantasy Hollywood world directly, the toy companies would have to invent one. The other interesting thing about G.I. Joe is that he is often given credit for being the first major American toy to be manufactured overseas. The 1950s and 60s are often seen as marking the beginning of a turning point in which many American businesses realized that it would be cheaper for them to outsource the manufacturing of their products to poorer countries where the rates one has to pay for hourly labor are cheaper. This seems weird now, but the original G.I. Joes were made in Japan because in the immediate aftermath of World War II, that country had obviously been quite economically devastated with their once mighty factories eager to take on any work they could get, even if that meant making dolls of the very American soldiers who had just beaten them. Operation, in which you have to fish body parts out of some hapless corpse with metal tweezers without completing a circuit that causes an obnoxious buzzer to sound, was developed in 1965 by one of America's oldest toy companies, the Milton Bradley Corporation, which was founded by a guy from Massachusetts named Milton Bradley, way back in 1860. From the very beginning, the Milton Bradley Company produced a number of board games that would go on to be some of America's most iconic, including the Game of Life, Candyland, Battleship, and Twister. So naturally, Hasbro had to get in on that, and they bought the company in 1984, acquiring all of these hot properties. The story behind Stretch Armstrong, the amazing stretchable action figure, isn't all that thrilling. He was invented by a Kenner employee named Jesse Horowitz in 1976, who just thought it would be a fun idea for a toy. Mr. Armstrong's somewhat Aryan appearance 
is often said to be inspired by many of the popular action hero movie stars of the time, like Lee Majors or Charlton Heston, as well as what by now had come to be the standard lantern-jawed all-American superhero look. A smaller toy company in Ohio called Cap Toys acquired the rights to Stretch in the 1990s and tried rebooting him as a more irreverent, cartoonish sort of character. But Hasbro put an end to that when they bought Cap Toys in 1997 and returned him to his classic look. All right, now this is one I feel pretty sentimental about because Glow Worm was one of my favorite toys when I was a kid in the 1980s. Judging from the ads, I wasn't exactly the target audience, but I did grow up into a weird adult, so it all tracks. Glow Worm was developed in-house by Hasbro's Baby Division in 1982, and as you can see, it was a little doll with a light-up face. This is a relatively sophisticated toy when you think about it, and reflected how, by the time I was a kid, American toy makers were free to pursue their most ambitious ideas, battery-operated toys in particular, becoming a very mainstream thing for the first time. By now, most American toys were being made in China, a place with even cheaper labor than Japan, meaning companies could get more ambitious with their toy designs without necessarily sacrificing too much of the profit margin, so long as, you know, the batteries were not included. Batteries not included. Batteries not included. Batteries not included. This plushy monster doll was another one I was very fond of as a kid, and another iconic 80s era toy that Hasbro developed in-house. And of course, he had his own show as well. I mean, even the Glow Worm had his own show at this point. What is interesting, however, is that unlike the Glow Worm, Hasbro did not come up with the My Pet Monster character themselves. They instead purchased it from the licensing department of the great Cincinnati-based greeting card company known as American Greetings, or as we call it in Canada, Carlton Cards. This was another very 80s thing. Companies would have whole departments whose only job was coming up with original characters with the hope of then selling these characters to other companies who could figure out something to do with them. The American Greetings people were particularly prolific at this and sold a couple of different characters to Hasbro, including My Pit Monster, as well as selling several other characters to their arch rivals over at Kenner, including the Care Bears and Strawberry Shortcake. But of course, Hasbro did ultimately buy Kenner in the early 1990s, so they got the last laugh. And there you have it, the great American post-war toy cannon. Or at least the Hasbro toy cannon, which may or may not be the same thing at this point. I would be curious to know, however, which iconic American toys you think are missing here, regardless if they are Hasbro or not. I can certainly think of at least one major toy franchise from Hasbro's one remaining rival in the American toy industry, Mattel, that deserves to be on any authoritative list of the most iconic American toys of the modern age. Do you know what it is? Anyway, let's discuss in the comments, and I will see you next week.